Well, for many people, a time of spring cleaning has arrived, a time to wash the grime away, a time to remove the winter bedding and replace it with something lighter, time to pack away the sweaters, amen, and unpack the shorts. And this is a time of year when a lot of organizations coordinate neighborhood cleanups and they hand out brooms, volunteers fill trash bags and the streets sparkle a little bit more. We all need to clean out and clean up on occasion. And the two scripture passages today, the scripture passage from Matthew, the scripture passage from James, they both comment on the need to clean out the stuff from our lives. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus commands his followers to not be hoarders, right? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, tchotchkes and magazines and collections of glassware. Well, he didn't say that last part, but do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. If you've ever visited the home of a hoarder, you know how difficult it is to move around the house due to all of the stacks of things, stacks of newspapers, books, food items. And while hoarding is an extreme case, in the United States, we do seem to have a bit of an issue with too much stuff. And I've shared this before, I'll share it again because it's so relevant. Not only has the average square footage of new home construction increased, there are also more self-storage units than ever before in our country. So we, we have so much stuff that we don't know what to do with it. So we're building bigger and more storage bins. 75% of middle class Americans cannot park their car in the garage because they have too much stuff. We are a people who love stuff, and that should not shock us because throughout history, throughout history, people have loved stuff and things. The issues we grapple with in modern times are not that different compared to ancient times. And James touches on the same issue in his letter. James writes, your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Oh my goodness. Well, these are items destined for a landfill in Seattle. James is arguing that our attachment to stuff actually causes a physical disturbance in our lives. The rust eats our flesh like fire. Our overload of stuff has a physical impact. And remember, the physical is connected to the spiritual, to the emotional, to the intellectual. It's all connected, right? It's all connected. The physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the intellectual. Well, Jesus knows our addiction to stuff. And Jesus calls us away from our things by saying, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, we do not take our stuff with us in the end. We don't take our garden gnome with us to the next life. We don't sit at the heavenly banquet table in our favorite chair. Oh, I'll miss my favorite chair. Orange chair fits just right. We don't sit in that chair at the heavenly banquet table. The treasures we store up for ourselves on earth, they decay. They become moth-ridden, full of mold and rust. They're easily pilfered by thieves or sold in a yard sale by our children or our children's children. Yet there are items that do have meaning, spiritual value. There's a terrific movie that came out recently. It's titled Woman in Gold. Has anyone had a chance to see this movie? Just a terrific movie. It's a story about a, a breathtaking Gustav Klimt portrait. And this portrait of a woman in gold, it was appropriated by the Nazis during World War II. And then it was appropriated by the Austrian government. But the painting originally belonged to the family of Maria Altman. And it was a portrait of her aunt, her Aunt Adele. Now Altman had escaped, to, uh, had escaped Austria. She landed in California and she started a long battle to reclaim the painting that was unjustly taken. So sometimes stuff, things, does have deep meaning and value. The point that Jesus is trying to make in Matthew's gospel is that we are not to make our stuff our reason for being. Our stuff is not to be the first or last thing that we dwell on in our daily lives. Instead, we receive such a clear directive from Jesus about what is to be our number one priority. Strive first, Jesus says, not second, not third, not somewhere down the list. Strive first 
for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. With God first, with God at the center, with God as the foundation, stuff no longer has as much of a hold over us. We no longer have to sweat about buying the stuff when we seek God first. We no longer have to sweat about buying the stuff, keeping up the stuff, making sure our stuff is better than our neighbor's stuff, or getting someone to overpay for our used stuff. With a spiritual journey, we are officially released from a life focused on stuff. Phew. And so cleaning out our stuff, it's not just a physical task. It's a spiritual opportunity. It's a release. It's a freeing up. It's making room for God. And there's even an embrace of social justice that happens when we realize our society's skewed relationship with things, which uh, so often leads to the issue of money. In James, there is a calling out. He writes this, listen, the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts. Well, James is on quite a roll here. All of this corruption ultimately leads people to condemn and murder the righteous one. And, you know, we may be thinking at this point, well, phew, I, I paid the mowing guy a good wage, right, to mow the lawn. We may be thinking, well, I don't live a life of luxury, so these words from James, they do not apply to me. And these words from James are mostly directed toward people who have great wealth and yet cheat people. And Jesus backs up what James is saying by telling his followers, you cannot serve both God and wealth. But in the spiritual way of life, Jesus and James make it clear that, that those who have money are expected to be generous and righteous and serve God before anything else. There are, is a good and challenging word for us in James today, for those of us who don't have fabulous amounts of wealth. We are all called to advocate for a living wage for all people. We don't want to fall into thinking that some people are somehow more deserving of others or that some people are are better than others. It's not a debate about who's working harder because if any one of us here has ever worked a minimum wage job, if anyone here is currently working at minimum wage, well then you know that the work is usually very, very hard. And as spiritual people, we simply want everyone to be better off. Amen? A living wage is not just a political issue. It's a moral issue. It's a spiritual issue. And Christians are called to be clean on this topic. So Christian employers are to provide a living wage and Christian employees are to give their best at the workplace. So it's two very powerful scripture passages today from Matthew, from James, and it's some, in some ways it seems as if Jesus is dismissing everything with his final words in that passage from Matthew. What does Jesus say? So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Hmm. Does this mean we don't have to bother with letting go of our stuff? or recognizing income inequality, or any of the other important topics that demand our attention. You know, in some ways, it seems like Jesus is saying, whatever, people, don't worry, be happy, whatever, or whatevs. Uh, Jesus has said that God would took, took care of the birds and looked after the fields, so God will look after us. The Gentiles, they worry and fret about what's ahead and what's going to happen, but the followers of Jesus are to live in the moment, live in the present, strive first for God's kingdom and God's righteousness, knowing that every good thing will be given. You know, sometimes I think, sometimes I think we have so much stuff and we have so many things because we are terrified of being considered less than another. We are scared of being alone. We are desperate to fill the empty places in our lives. If we just buy more stuff, if we just 
check our cell phone one more time, if we just make sure that everything is planned out to the very last detail, then supposedly everything will be okay. But what we find out when we buy more stuff, what we find out when we check the cell phone one more time, what we find out when we plan everything out so that we squeeze every last bit of the Holy Spirit out of it, what we find out is that we are lonelier and emptier than ever. We actually desperately need Jesus to say whatever to us sometimes. We need Jesus to say whatever to our stuff. We need Jesus to say whatever to our plans, whatever to our endless need to have the latest information about something or someone. Because that's not what really matters. It's the kingdom of God that matters most. The kingdom of God where love and justice and righteousness and holiness and grace and mercy rule the day. So spiritual spring cleaning is about cleaning out the things that do not matter to make more space for the kingdom of God to take root in our lives. And so today we have an opportunity to think about what it is we may need to sweep away to make room for the kingdom of God. What it is, what do we need to sweep away to make more space for God's righteousness in our lives? What is it we need to sweep away? What is it that we need to release in order to be on a more spiritual path. So a spiritual spring cleaning involves cleaning out the stuff that holds us back from God and takes away from our time with God. Both Jesus and James are very clear about the stuff and how the stuff holds us back from full spiritual participation. But the point is not to go home today and feel bad about our stuff. The point is not to go home today and feel guilty about our stuff. Jesus is not in the business of making people feel downtrodden and feel like there's no hope. We release things not because we're bad. We release the stuff so that we may have more of God in our lives. More of God. And it's not just the physical stuff we release from our lives, right? There's a whole lot that we may sweep away from our lives. Our need to be in control may be swept away. Giving control over to God is one of the most difficult processes we undergo in the spiritual life, but God is to be trusted. Our anger at how things have gone may be swept away. The unfairness that happened in our family, the relationship where we got burned, the job opportunity that didn't pan out how we had hoped. We cannot change the past. Even God cannot change the past, but God can redeem it. Our despair over injustices of the world may be swept away. The wars, the violence, the abuses of governments and corporate powers. When we hold on to despair, we do not let God usher in peace or harmony. God wants to co-create with us a better world. And if we sit too long in despair, God cannot use us to God's glory. Or maybe it's not despair that needs to be swept away. Maybe it's apathy that needs to be swept away. The not wanting to do anything because nothing ever changes. Well, God wants to use us as instruments of transformation. But if we sit back and refuse to participate, nothing will change. Our fear needs to be swept away. That thing that keeps us from sleep and, and makes us like the Gentiles. Fear may overwhelm us, but love casts out fear. When we lean on the Lord, when we abide in love, fear fades. So we sweep away our need to be in control. We sweep away our anger. We sweep away our despair, our apathy, our fear. We sweep it away so that God may enter more fully into our lives. And these are all good things to sweep away, anger, despair, fear. But there's something else that needs to be cleaned out this spring. And it may seem very small, just a little voice. A little voice that tells us that this spiritual thing doesn't work. This spiritual thing is ineffective. It's that voice that whispers, urging us to do life on our own, to do life apart from God. There's something that's, that's tugging us away from holiness and righteousness, telling us that it's impossible, so why even attempt to live spiritually? There's something that's pulling us in the direction of self telling us that we matter most. We're the center of the world. 
God is not the center. We're number one. There's something that's drawing us away from prayer and worship and spiritual study and fellowship with a community of people, telling us that the church has lost its meaning and God is not powerful. Well, I'm only able to give a very short testimony here. I'm not able to speak for anyone else, of course, but I can say without any doubt whatsoever that the spiritual life is the only way of life that gives any meaning. Now, I have doubts about many things, various theologies, doctrines, biblical interpretations, but these doubts keep me on my toes. Of this, I am sure. Striving first for God, striving first for God's righteousness is the greatest thing that has ever happened in my life. It is the greatest call that God has placed on my heart, and it is the only thing that keeps me sane and pointed toward wholeness. And as an added bonus... The striving for God has brought the great honor of being connected with the members and friends of MCCLV. So I need to sweep away that little small voice that tugs me away from the spiritual life. I need to sweep away that voice that, that tells me to separate myself from God and do life on my own. But you know, I've also had to sweep away some ideas about God that are not particularly fruitful. Along the way, we may need to sweep away some understandings we have about God and church and liturgy and who Christ is and how biblical passages are interpreted. Spiritual growth means that we come to different understandings along the way. There's nothing bad or wrong about gaining wisdom and insight. And in letting go of some of the old ways, it doesn't mean we release everything. We clear out and we clean out again so that God may have more of a place in our lives. 